Okay, so um, let me say this on the record uh, that uh, this lecture should be used only when needed, uh, when you have to miss class or something, uh, but not on a regular basis. So um, participation in class is, is key, and you know, uh, I think I'll start uh, taking roles um, just to keep track of attendance. Um, it's it's been it's happened in the past that I've uh, you know we we uh, found ourselves at the end of the semester and students would come to take the exams wouldn't do good and they wouldn't know why I mean they were like yeah I've been watching the lectures but I think there's still a disconnect if you if you um, rely on the lectures too much uh, so. Let's see, obviously I printed too many copies here, um, but I have a few handouts that I want to um, give. And also, if you look at the course website, you will see most of these handouts are listed here. So that was, yeah. So the first two are, um, I think they're the last one, well, number C here, are on the HIV infection modeling. So uh, this particular one that I call baby model is just a one piece of paper, one sheet that um, I put together for a model that uh, describes sort of um, dynamics of of the HIV infection uh, in a certain in a certain uh, organism so here I just kind of describe the variables there are four variables and there are um, there's going to be four rates of change right and you see the rates of change of the, of the four variables um, depend on, in, in a nonlinear fashion, on the var variables themselves. So you can see this is a dynamical system, right? Uh, in 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 four dimensions, uh, with a bunch of parameters. And again, I don't have time to talk about significance of these parameters. But you can take this, say the numbers that are given here, and the initial conditions. And uh, just run the run the simulation and see what happens. Um, the code for well, there there is there there are built-in codes for in MATLAB for solving uh, systems of differential equation of any order. Uh, but if you want um, GUI, there is same place this um, same place as. P plane and direction field. If you go to this uh, website uh, at Rice University, uh, OD Solve is. I may have shown you this, but if not, uh, it's the same as P plane. Well, it's similar to P plane the way you. Uh, it starts. Uh, with the exception that now you can actually change the number of equations. So remember, p-plane p only had two equations. Um, so you can you can actually now can keep on. Can I look at one? Oh, there, there's plenty. Can I have the extras? Thank you. Um, so you can type in those equations, put in the parameters. Thank you. Um, let me give, give you this handout too. And um, notice that there aren't there aren't too many uh, places. I mean, there are places for six parameters. So if you need more parameters, you can use them in the expressions. And if you are uh, really kind of running out, if you have more parameters than this, then I guess you can just hard you know type them in the equation, right? Okay, so I'll leave this as an exercise. You know, I won't 
um, do this completely here, but um, you can get creative with the, num with the names of the parameters. Lambda minus mu times t minus k times t times v, right? And so forth. L, I, and V. Each has a significance that's indicated on this handout. So then you have initial conditions, right? And you have solutions. Uh, you have the number, uh, excuse me, the solution interval. So T runs between this and this. Um, it may need to be changed, depends on, on the. Um, I don't know if it's seconds or days. I believe this is days in days. Um, and then you select the solver. So this typical, typically you start with the OD45, which is Rangakara, the solver. And you can do a time plot. So you can see basically the four variables. You know, the, starting with those initial conditions, what happens with the four variables? OK? And that is. Yeah. But, um, where do you put uh, mu, for example? Is it a parameter? Yeah. So lambda and so forth, right? So you just put in 1272. That's right. Lambda is, mu is. Okay. Takes a little bit of work, but. Um, How do you get more parameters? Times the negative yeah. 3. Well, as I said, you can use these expressions. So in these expressions, you can actually, you can have a, you can have a, a parameter that depends on time, and actually, you know, you can have a variable coefficient uh, in the in those equations. You could have a non-autonomous system, right? But again, you could use these spaces for the for, the, for the extra parameters. And if you run out of everything, you you just type it. You know, you just type it in the equation. I don't know. Um, okay, so you do this, and of course you have to um, you have to fill in everything. Otherwise, it will tell you something is not defined, right? So let me not do this uh, completely, but I'll just give you this. Uh, here and that if you uh, once you're done with the work, you know you save the, the this uh, this system, and it saves with this uh, extension ODS. I don't know. You give the names SHIV, and um, and now when you close this, you can actually call it again. You know. Uh, you can actually load it, load the system, right? So you have to type it again. Um, or I believe you can even, you can, um, you can call it from this OD solve and then uh, HIV ODS. Actually, the problem is it was saved somewhere else, so you just have to see where it was saved. <coughs> well, anyway, you can just do this. I think if it's loaded, yeah, it's saved in uh, hmm, HIV. Okay, so I don't know why it's not there. You can just load the system, okay? All right. Um, so that's one thing, and uh, there is a um, much longer or much more in-depth um, article, a review article from 1999, 
that um, you know kind of explains how that model comes into uh, being. Um, this is one of the very famous mathematicians that has worked in this um, infectious disease modeling, the infectious disease, uh, Alan Perlson. And uh, again, you, 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 you see some of the graphs that you can actually reproduce on your own. And um, if you look through this, of course, the first part is uh, a lot of uh, the biology of it, but uh, soon you'll start seeing the equations that maybe are not exactly the same as this baby model, but they're in the same ballpark. And um, so it's a kind of an interesting, you know, um, and it's a sort of a reference article, okay, uh, about modeling the HIV. Okay, so that's one thing, and again, we won't be talking about this much, but I, I invite you to kind of look, you know, at least um, see what are the what are the problems, what are the limitations uh, with higher dimensional dynamical systems, you know, um, and when you have a two di a two dimensional dynamical system, so two variables, you know, you have the plane that you can analyze. Um, you know, null clients, you can analyze stability, you know, steady states. You can see the solutions, right? It's much simpler. When you start doing four dimensional, uh, the only thing you can display is time evolution, right? For, for specific initial conditions. And there are other tricks by which you can actually represent your data. Represent, you can do, a, I think, a 2D or 3D plot of. Uh, one versus, you know, kind of selected number of, I think if you look in the gallery, uh, Lawrence is three variables. This has to do with some chaotic behavior. So this is time evolution of those. Again, it's a dynamical system with three, three uh, unknowns, three, three uh, variables, state variables. Uh, but you can also do a 3D plot, X versus Y versus Z, which is gives the famous, um, what's called strange, strange attractor, right? I think you can even uh, rotate, I forgot how to rotate. So, so you can see that again the trajectory. You don't see the time; you just see the trace that that part, particle or that um, initial condition leaves as it as it uh, moves in the space. Okay, but uh, when you start talking about like, whoops, I always do this. Uh, when you start, as I said, uh, four-dimensional. So, if you look at two springs, so this would be two springs attach one to a two spring mass system right then you have this is a four dimensional dynamical system there are four 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 degrees of freedom right um, and the time plot may may tell you something but may not be exactly what you want so then you could plot for instance for the first spring you could plot x versus u so this is the position versus the angular velocity. Okay. This may tell you something or may not tell you something. Or you can plot, you know, at most two or three variables, right? You cannot plot four variables. Um, one thing that I want to point out in this is, so I have a two spring. So I have basically, or actually it could be a double pendulum too, right? Um, similar thing. If I have, if I'm looking at the first pendulum or the first spring mass system, right, that's affected by the motion of the second one, right? And the second one is time dependent. So if you only focus on the first, you know, position and momentum of a component of the system, then what kind of what kind of dynamic is, is that? 
what kind of what kind of dynamical system is it? Autonomous or non-autonomous? Well, you can think of the pendulum as being, the first pendulum as being forced by the second pendulum, right? And the second pendulum is time dependent. So you have in your system you have a forcing that's time dependent. If you look at just look at the equations here, you see if you if you only try to isolate the first system of the first two equations, you see that there is the y that's the second position position of the second uh, pendulum or second spring mass, right? And that's going to be time dependent. So if you only try to isolate the first one, that's going to be a non-autonomous system. Right? Non-autonomous system, what happens with the solution curves if you are to, to plot in a, in, a, in a phase plane? What's different from between this and something that's, uh, let's see, a two-dimensional system? And again, this is a time plot, but the p plane thing, sorry. Ooh. Um. No, let me go back to the p plane since. So take anything that's like part of prey, right? What do you notice with the trajectories, with the solutions to this autonomous system? They never inter intersect, right? So they, they don't, so two distinct, distinct trajectories never intersect. Or if you start with a if you start with a you know with a solution, and you follow that trajectory, it never intersects. Like um, you know, you know, like in a point, it's either it would it would kind of in this case it would be a periodic solution, right? Which you could see if you were to plot. Uh, Let's see if I do both versus time. Um, let's see, I don't know why I cannot see the versus time. Maybe I should change. Uh, let me try. Let me try a competing species like the ones we talked about. Okay, you can see x versus t. Oh yeah. Okay. So you can see um, both x. Oh yeah, I think we have to click on on a previously computed solution to see this, right? So, so you see both x and y versus t for this particular uh, trajectory, right? But the trajectory itself never, and th there are no two that actually intersect, right? So this is a signature of, of being autonomous system, right? Why? Because in autonomous system, it doesn't matter when you start, right? Um, if you start at a, loca a specific location, then you follow basically your solution in an unique fashion. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. Um, if if the if the equations are are not, you know, the right hand sides are not really nice functions, then you may run into problems of uniqueness. But um, Assuming that the you know the left and the right I mean the right hand side of your dynamical system is say continuously differentiable so it has derivatives that are continuous um, then the solution 
given give initial condition, the solution is going to be unique, right? At that point. So it means that for this system, at this point, I cannot have a, a solution that actually self-intersects, or two different solutions that intersect, right? Whereas when it's time dependent, so again, this is um, if you, I believe here, if you put a time dependent part, let's see, I'm curious what happens. So if I have some sort of forcing, let's say sine of, a, sine of t, yeah, see in p plane it doesn't even accept time dependent. Um, I believe, let me try T. Yep, so P plane is for autonomous systems. If you need a non-autonomous system, even 2D, then you have to move to this other one, right? So again, this is autonomous. Solutions will not intersect by default. You don't see that, but in the, in the plane, It's a little bit, by default, it, it plots the time plot, but if you have to do the um, phase plot, okay. Now, there is something funny going on there. It looks like it's, um, what do you think is happening? Hmm? Looks like it's not coming back and, and doing a periodic. So, if you do like t uh, between zero and a hundred, you see can kind of it, it feels like it's truly really moving away. Um, but the reality is, I mean, can this happen in an autonomous system? In principle, it could, right? But it's more likely that it's actually the error in the computation that's that's actually. Uh, Moving it, you know, farther and farther away, right? So, even even if this is not true error in the computation because it's autonomous, this should not self-intersect, right? It should probably spiral out if if it does, but we don't. Uh, I think it's more likely it's a, it's a it's a and it's an error basically. Okay. So I just wanted to show you a, a, a non-autonomous one, which was. Forced oscillation. So forced oscillation basically says, I don't know if you can see it, but there is an extra term in the velocity. So it's like a, oh, excuse me, in the acceleration, right? The derivative of the velocity. So that's, so there's actually a force that's uh, time dependent on oscillating, call sign, right? Of some frequency, 2t. Yeah? There's a forced spring mass with um, with some d damping and then some force oscillation and it's always time time evolution here but if you do a time plot uh, excuse me a phase plot then it does self intersect right because you have because this maybe probably that's where you started at x0 right but then as you move and you try to, to fit that direction field, that direction field changes. So it's always kind of constantly trying to adjust to the new direction field. Okay? By the way, that's the reason why you don't see any direction field in ODE solve. I mean, how could you see it? You'd have to make a really fancy sort of way in which you see how the, the direction field changes with time, right? And another thing is, if you start at the same location but at a different time, it will do a different thing, right? Because at a different time, the force is probably going to be different. Okay, so all of these things are kind of interesting to uh, to understand through through these examples, these properties of uh, continuous time dynamical systems. So I, I hope you can uh, use this tool. 
Uh, and the last handout, let's see, any questions on this HIV thing? The last handout was a model of cancer. Um, not, a, not as much growth, but just a cancer treatment using a competition model. I only made copies of the first two pages, but you can access uh, the whole, the whole um, um, article. So, so there, there's a myriad of examples of models. Um, this one that I pointed is is in a book I think that appeared in 2007 and I think it's chapter 9 so you can just get the whole um, you know you can read the whole um, article and you can see things are I mean the models that one starts with are pretty basic I mean it's like the whale problem if you want right but it very quickly moves to uh, more realistic ones. So it starts with what you've seen in the logistic growth, right, for each population. Of course, in this case, it's it's a different thing. It's X1 is the number, the concentration of normal cells. X2 is concentration of cell of cancer cells, right? So then it's some sort of competition between normal and and cancer cells. Um, and the point is, and we're going to revisit this, not necessarily on this example, is that treatment means that you actually affect the rate of change or the, the growth rate of the normal cells and cancer cells with certain terms, you know, with certain um, terms. And um, I think this article just kind of talks about different... Um, strategies for treatment that would uh, drive what? X2 to zero, right? The cancer cells to zero. Um, again, other there are other uh, examples. I think there is uh, this chapter one, uh, no, I'm sorry, chapter two talks about uh, epidemic dynamics. I think it's doing, uh, oh, this one is doing the uh, SIR epidemic. So that's another uh, source. Let's see, and two more, which I didn't make. Um, I don't believe I made copies, but there are the two books that I mentioned in the syllabus that, that uh, we're going to be kind of referring to. Uh, one is this mathematical models for life sciences. And you can see there are two chapters, one on continuous time dynamical systems, one on discrete time dynamical systems. Um, I will turn off the...
Wow. Okay. I thought I turned it on. Yeah, in fact, I think it was it was always off. Then it was on, and then it was off. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so there are three variables. There are two, in, a, in a population, there are three types. There's the susceptible population of individuals. So there's individuals that can be infected uh, but are not infected. There is the infected population. And um, I think the rest was are basically the immune population that are not infected but are not susceptible so they you know they had the disease I guess um, so once again this these three variables appear in that um, in that model in that uh, which I couldn't display um, and the, the dynamical system well so one assumption is that s plus i plus r equals um, constant as the total population. Of course, this assumes that um, the disease doesn't kill people, so there's like the same population over time, but uh, typically that's not true, so this is just a kind of a simple assumption. But anyway, the, uh, the rates of change of this are as follows, so there's like a constant and I may not use the same uh, letters for the constants, but you can see the terms are sort of um, the same type of comp comp competing term, comp competition term, right? Prey to prey term. So it's a product between uh, kind of the it's the interaction number of interactions between the susceptible and the the um, infected population, right? So there's a there's a decrease in the number of susceptible population due to that interaction. Uh, the infected population, of course, grows if there is infected people um, um, interacting with susceptible pop people, and there is also an intrinsic. Um, it's not a growth, but it's a decay, saying that. If you are, if you get infected, you know, after a certain amount of time, at a certain rate, you're actually become immune, right? So you get cured, I guess. And last one is again. This is just, I guess, uh, I should. I'm sorry, I shouldn't put. This is just. This is um, the model for problem number ten in the in the chapter four. So there's maybe a gamma here, something like that. Okay. So by the way, one thing you should notice here: so a, gamma are parameters, and um, one could do some sort of sensitivity to to these parameters. Yeah. Uh, so this is from the case studies. book by uh, I think the authors are Cald Caldwell and and G okay so also see also uh, problem number 10 in uh, chapter in our book So it talks about the same model. Okay, so let me move to uh, discrete systems and just tell you what are the, what are the differences.
All right, so um, let me just kind of make a parallel with the continuous dynamical systems. So in discrete dynamical systems, usually we have a change, if you want, over a period of time, a fixed period of time, right, that is described as a function of the current state. Okay, so the so x is a state variable, right? And it could be I don't know, it could be uh, not not one, but many, right? Number of state variables. So this is state variables. And uh, delta t is some fixed time period. I don't know, one second, one day, one year. It depends on the problem, right? But it's sort of a, it's saying that whatever experiment we do, we only care about the change during this, you know, at each, at, 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 after each uh, such period of time. It's like a sample, right? So, um, and the model just tells us there is a change uh, or the change that is, a, is occurring during that period of time depends somehow on the current state, right? So, for 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 uh, all practical purposes, we're gonna assume that uh, delta t is one. I mean, if it's not one, it, it just moves it to the right, right? So. So really what we have is we have a dynamical, well, we'll see why it's a dynamical system, but we have um, a law that says the change in x is a function of x, okay? And this is to contrast, of course, the, uh, the, the continuous time dynamical system, right? Where this would be sort of an infinitesimal change, right? So that, that law says it's an infinitesimal change of the state variable as a function of the current state, okay? So, um, so typically, we're going to think about um, delta x to be a a change, and again, this could be a um, vector, right? This could be several components. So we're going to think about the, uh, this is the new or the next value of x minus the, uh, the current or the old value of x as a function of the old value of x, okay? So what you see here is that because of the, the, the model comes as a change, delta x is given as a function of, of, of x, um, that the new state, so you, when you update, when you compute the new state, what you're going to see is a x old plus f of x old. Okay. So this is conveniently written as it's a new function, let's call it g of the old state. So this is where g of x is just x plus the right hand side, right? Of your model. Okay. So this is actually now it's different than continuous time dynamical systems where you have to solve um, so a differential equation. In this case, what do you have to, what, what is this? Well, so this is upon iterations of this, here's what you get. You start, so start with, with x zero, 
right? There's the initial condition. Then you're going to be x1 is going to be, I don't know, I think I use the super, superscripts. So x0 is x0. x1 is g of x0, right? x2 is going to be, so you see that's why it's convenient to have the g because you just apply g to the current state and you get the new state. Okay? Rather than making the difference, rather than using the f, right? f would give it the difference and then you have to add the x old. So that's the only thing. Um, so in general you have xn plus 1 equals g of xn. Yep. And you can think of you know, just imagining n equals, uh, okay, now we're going to get into trouble with little n should, should be, let's see, do I use different, oh well. Um, let's say two variables. I want to just say n equals 2, but, um, so if I have x1, x2 here, right, then what's going to happen? I mean, what is this iteration doing? It's basically saying, um, take x n, let's say this is the current state, right? And compute the new state. Now, how is this going to be computed? Well, the difference, coming back to the, to the original equation, the difference is, so this vector, if you want, from xn to xn plus 1 is going to equal, equal exactly f at xn, right? But, so, uh, graphically, this is what you're going if to, you, if you have to d display graphically, this is what you'll see. You'll see basically uh, f evaluated at each state and just kind of put, um, you know, kind of add those uh, vectors together, right? So fn plus 1 is going to start where fn ended and so forth, right? Okay, so, so in a way it's kind of, it's hopping on top of the direction field uh, given by the right hand side of that of that of that model um, but let's talk about a particular case and then we're going to talk about an exact uh, model but a particular case is when G is linear that is F is linear what does it mean linear well If f is linear, f, f to be linear, it means that this is just a matrix. I'm going to call it A. Let's call it um, B times x, right? So it's, it's in effect, is some sort of x1, x, let's call it k. I, should, I, should, I want to change this from n to k because n is going to stand for the number of iteration, um, right? And this is going to be b11, b1k, bk1, bkk, okay? So that's what it means that f is linear. which would make g to be what? Well, it's x plus f, so it's x plus b times x, so this is just the identity matrix plus b times x, right?
So bottom line is, if your metrics, if excuse me, if your right hand side is like a metrics multiplication, then that's a very special case, very uh, very easy case to analyze because because um, iterations of this system are, are as follows. What is x1? x1 is a times x0, right? x2 is a times of x1, so it's a squared times x0. So in general, is xn is going to be the nth power of this matrix times x0. Okay? So this is an is the nth power of a. Okay? Now imagine, of course, this is not going to be always the case, but imagine a is uh, a diagonal matrix. So say a is a diagonal matrix, then what happens with the how do you raise a diagonal matrix to uh, multiply with itself n times? It's the same as multiplying the diagonal. Yeah, well, that, right? So you, you raise this. Uh, these are the eigenvalues of this matrix, right? So it's like raising the, the eigenvalues of this matrix to the power n, right? And uh, what can you say about as n goes to infinity, well, there are only a few possibilities, right? In this in this special case, if lambda lambda could be well could be complex, but let's say it's real, but it's uh, an absolute value less than one, so between negative one and one, then what has what happens with a actually I'm I'm sorry I should say strictly less than one. What, hap what happens with the powers of a number that's less than 1? Goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So let's say if both are less than 1, then both go to 0, right? Meaning that this matrix is going to go to 0. So this means that xn is going to go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Well, what is that? What is that supposed to mean? In this picture, it says if I start with x not here, you know, I'm gonna hop on the first, right? Maybe hop on the first, uh, take the first vector, right, and reach to x1. But eventually, what's going to happen is you're going to go to zero, right? Not necessarily in this fashion, but in some 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 sort of fashion, right? And that tells uh, something about the steady state. What is the steady state of the system? Well, again, it's unfortunately you have to go back and forth between the the original system, which is a, has a change in x, and the iterate, iteration system. So, so easiest is to, to think what is a steady state for this for this uh, dynamical system. Well, a steady state is a state that once you're there, you stay there forever, right? So there's no change. So this basically means that's one f it's zero at that state, right? So steady state for this is uh, x star for which f of x star is zero. So it's just like in the continuous dynamic system, you look at the right-hand side and you set it equal to zero, and you get the places where this is zero. Now, you tell me when I have a matrix, what do we call it? This was B, 
So if in the linear case B was, I mean F was uh, just a matrix multiplication, right? And now I guess I should say if B is invertible, then 0 is the only steady state. If B is not invertible, 0 is still a steady state, right? So 0 is always a steady state, right? So, uh, but there may be others, okay? In fact, if F is not invertible, then you can, you have a whole kind of uh, line or some sort of subspace of zeros. So that's, I mean, that's a possibility, but it's sort of a degenerate case, right? So, in other words, this iteration is telling you what uh, what's the nature of this of this steady state, right? Whether it's stable, like things go to it, right, or don't go to it. This is if, if this is if if the if the, uh, if, if the problem is linear. If the problem is nonlinear, you know you can have all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay. Even in 1D. So if it's invertible, there's more than one steady state, not necessarily all the same. If, 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 it's not, if it happens to not to be invertible, then, then uh, when you solve this, you're going to get a um, whole subspace, like, whole, like a line of, of, of points, of zeros. Which means, well, which means that the uh, steady state there is not asymptotically stable. It doesn't, things don't go to it. You, things starting nearby on that particular line might stay, you know, might stay at that, those points. Okay. But I, I mean, you, you deal with this case case by case, right? So you have a problem. You look at the steady states. You look you look for the steady states. Then you analyze each, right? So let me just say about. Uh, this docking problem. Um, so, it has to do with the the problem is sort of uh, you start with a spacecraft, whatever, and you uh, can only maneuver it at discrete times, at discrete moments of time. So you have some you know, some um, uh, delays if you want. Uh, and you'd like to dock it. I don't know, let's say I want to dock it. This is a uh, International Space Station, right? And uh, this is a sim simplistic kind of um, situation where you, you can move it. You know, you're really close to it, but you can move it in only one direction, right? And what you want to do is you want to you know, be able to stop it, you know, at zero, right? So this is, this would be x equal, uh, well, whatever the x is, right? So you want to, you're maneuvering it. Um, you start with some initial condition, with some initial velocity, some initial acceleration, and then you, for, you know, you force it. Um, you modify its acceleration. You control it so that you. Um, the goal is to get uh, on the dock with velocity zero, right? So, so here's the control. I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Um, the control. The control is the so. A n is the acceleration at time t, at time uh, tn, it's like n delta t, and vn is the velocity at time t, tn, and here's the control law, so sorry, this, the control law is, it says that the acceleration is proportional to the velocity and with an 
uh, with a negative constant. So minus k with k is positive, saying that if I have a velocity that's moving in, you know, in the positive direction, let's say, right, then you want to break. So you want to put a negative acceleration to it. Um, so let's see the. Kind of the um, uh, the law that comes out of this modeling is is that the rate, the change in the velocity so from the previous velocity to the current velocity uh, it's proportional to so there are, there are some constants here it's proportional to the acceleration at the current current time and uh, the the acceleration of the previous time. So this is going to be equal to minus CK VN. Sorry, I'm going to put the subscript here. Minus WK VN. Okay, and this doesn't quite look like a dynamical system the way we want it, right? So we remember what do we want? We want something to be a rate of, I mean, a change in the system, in the state of the system, to be a function of the current uh, current state. Okay? So the way it looks right now, it says the following: it says v n plus one minus v n is minus CK VN minus 1 minus WK VN, right? Which is really a recursion relation, a second order recursion relation, because you see, you can use this equation to find the new velocity if you know the two previous velocities. So that's why we say it's second order, right? So in other words, we can put Vm plus 1 equals, uh, what is it? 1 minus Wk Vn minus Ck Vn minus 1, OK? But this requires, so requires the two previous values of the velocity um, at each time step. In particular, it requires, so also requires the first, the first two, so they, I guess V0 and V1. Okay, so you do need to know the velocity at you know, two two values of the velocity to to be able to um, to get the new one the the, sec, the v2 for instance okay so because of this I mean sometimes you can deal with this kind of uh, recursion relations and there are there are ways to solve this it's linear also it's linear if you look at uh, everything is a constant w k and c are constants. So this is this is linear in the unknown v, but um, so the key modification is to rewrite this in the following sense. So it's to consider the state variables as being the current velocity and the uh, Velocity is the previous step. Okay. So this is current velocity, and this is the previous velocity. All right. And with this, you can actually rewrite the second order recursion relation as a first order recursion relation. It's, it's exactly the same as you do when you do. When you have differential equations, second order equations, you write them as first order systems. 
So let's just do this um, really quick. So, so what is it going to be? The change in, or actually, we don't even have to do changes. Um, but I guess I guess let's start by saying what will be the change in the state of the system. So this is new x1, x2 minus old. Right? So it's going to be, um, let's see, vn plus 1 minus vn, and vn minus vn minus 1. Okay? So this is going to be minus ck vn minus 1 minus k w vn, and it's going to be vn minus vn minus 1. So one more step, you can isolate the x1, so vn, vn minus 1, and you can build, you can see what this matrix is, minus kw, minus kc, 1 and negative 1, right? So this is exactly b times x, where, right, this is x, so b is this matrix, minus k w minus kc, 1 minus 1, right? Because this is just x1 and x2. So this is x1, x2. So take a look. You have delta x is a, is a linear function of x. I mean, linear in the sense that it's a matrix multiplication by x. So what is it going to be the system then? that needs to be iterated. So xn plus 1 is going to be x plus xn plus bxn. So this is going to be identity plus b times xn. So, so call this a if you want, right? So what is the matrix a? Is going to be? 1 minus kw minus kc, 1 and 0. Okay? So this matrix is what needs to be raised to, you know, uh, consecutive powers. And I think I have it here. Let me just look at the... Um, Just one minute, it's going to take. So if you look at this, um, system, the system is over here. Now you see I do it as far, I mean, as, as changes in the current state. So that that is that matrix B, right? And you can see the direction field. So the direction field tells you if I start somewhere, then I'm going to hop on that and then follow the direction field. But to actually compute, make the computation, there's an iteration step here which does compute the, the new x by adding the to the old x a term, right? The function, the right-hand side of that original uh, problem. Now, there are two ways to do it. One is to just hard code it here. So just code it like that, like like we did there above. Uh, or the way I do it here is actually um, define a, new, a function that, it, that needs to be called. Okay, so the function is a separate file. Did I actually post this? I, didn't, I don't think I posted it, huh? Yeah, I posted this, okay. So this function, which is of course very simple, but needs to be saved in the same place as the main code so that when you run this it knows where to how to compute it right and then it just plots those consecutive numbers right and if you test it 
uh, we'll talk about this, you know, next in chapter five about the eigenvalues, right? So the, that matrix A it indeed has eigenvalues that are less than one in absolute value. Um, there was a question of why this num these values of the constants, and I think this the first two uh, values are um, whatever the meaning is. Uh, I chose so that is the same as the problem in the homework. Right, so that you don't have to modify any of that. Um, this value is, is given to you in the homework and is different than this. But other than that, I think the code should be pretty much the same, right? All right, so that's it. And sorry for the audio problems.